FM. I'm not going to my screen is Tom Manja. Is that how you pronounce your name? Of course, Miazga. Ah, oh, yeah. Sounds better than your voice anyway. <laughs> um, you're a former Paralympian, only in Beijing. We'll get into yep. it that in a minute. Um, and in the United States, or for Scotton. Um, welcome along. Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it, Peter. Glad to have it. Glad to be here. Thanks. Um, so before we get into anything else, um, I did a little bit of research, um, probably research, and you've got cerebral palsy. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically spastic diplegia. Uh, so all of my disability is down in my lower half. So I'd say kind of like to that at the top of the lower ab down, especially through the hip flexors and hamstrings all the way down to the toes. So, um, I have the ability to walk. I do use a wheelchair. So. Believe it or not, there are people that use wheelchairs that aren't uh, paralyzed waist down. But um, so I'll get up and walk around quite a bit. I don't use my wheelchair in my home at all. Um, it's more for long distances. And um, when I'm coaching, too, it's just easier for convenience for getting around and uh, making sure I'm on time more than anything. So, um, yeah, it's from birth. It's been something I've dealt with my whole life. Um, I've had a few surgeries growing up as well that helped um, specifically with my spastic diplegia. My lower half is so tight and so rigid that um, as I was growing, my musculature didn't grow at the same rate that my skeletal system was growing. So my bro bones were going longer, but as my muscles were so tight, they weren't growing at the same speed as my bones. And so there were a lot of surgeries to make sure that, you know, there was no extraneous repercussions to the point where I couldn't walk or that um, the pain was so severe or um there was more deformity than there needed to be. So um, I've had a lot of muscle lengthening surgeries. My last one being in my fourth grade summer. Um, so way back when. <laughs> um, way back so when. that's uh, that's been steady ever since. And so it did improve my gait quite a bit too. The last surgery I had, did a lot of work on my calves and Achilles. Um, so I was able to get a much more heel toe style gait. Um, but I still, my hip flexors are so tight that I have to swing my legs quite a bit to get around rather than, a normal stride. So um, that's never really changed. It's gotten more convenient by having a better planted foot when I hit the floor with my legs. But other than that, um, yeah, walking looks a bit arduous and it looks like a lot, but um, I promise it doesn't hurt or it doesn't look like it's, uh, doesn't feel like it looks, I should say. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are so busy, look like they're just walking around drunk, you know, <laughs> and it's uh... It's a lot of swaying. Yeah, there's a lot of back and forth to it for sure. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody questioned my uh, alcohol consumption at eight o'clock on a Wednesday morning if they had to, because it does look that way. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and as a baby, you walked quite late. Apparently, is that right? Yeah. So we didn't really know that I had cerebral palsy until much later on. It wasn't right away at birth. They were like, doctors were like, oh, yep. We got a, we got CP, we got to fix this. No, it was, um, I'm the youngest of four actually. And so, um, based on the timeline of the rest of my, my siblings, I started walking much later in the sense that it was a little bit past the traditional, you know, timeline of a toddler. So it was more of, if you're walking around one year, I would say I was closer to like one and a quarter, maybe 18 months that I started walking. And when I did walk, um, I was holding on to things the entire time. It was always, grabbing onto the couch as I walked by or grabbing onto a counter and ledge or something just to make sure I was stable. And my parents just didn't, we didn't really think much of it in the beginning, but as soon as I started to let go of things, then my balance and my, my wobbliness, if you will, really started to show itself. And so then we realized that, okay, maybe there's something a little bit more pre-existing here. I didn't realize. Um, and so that's when we went in, you know, saw the pediatrician and stuff like that and found out we had, I had CP. Uh, CP. So, um, yeah, didn't hit the benchmarks quite at the right time. And obviously then that led to some more missed benchmarks, if you will. And, you know, some physical deformities in the sense that like my hips didn't quite turn out the same way that an infant's would. So as I started to grow and develop your hips and open up and your femurs turn outward, mine didn't do that as much. So my knees still kind of angle quite inward and, and concave, like especially by a squat, my knees are coming towards each other rather than naturally wanting to push away. So, um, yeah, a lot of telltale signs that very quickly after we saw the first few that were like, okay, something's going on. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure how old 
that's very natural in the CP world, isn't it? When you can't walk mm-hmm. in on to poetry. Um, yeah. The doctors had no idea why you've got it, so you weren't premature or anything. No, no. And that's a, that's a case with a lot of CP, you know. Yeah. Many, many of the known cases come from a very premature birth. Um, there may be umbilical cords st- strangulation during labor, or so there's an oxygen asphyxiation where the brain's not getting enough oxygen as the baby's being pushed out, um, or even just in in uh, pregnancy, right? That may happen as well. So um, a lot of CP, though, is unknown. So there is no, there was nothing that happened. So there was no actions my mother did or anything during pregnancy that would have said, you know, Tom's going to come out with CP. It was just a, a fluke. So a lot of cases they say are actually that way too. So um, it's a pretty common disorder, right? It's, I think they say almost one in 500 individuals have CP. So it's very, and it's a, it's a wide spectrum, right? There are individuals that you wouldn't even know that have cerebral palsy to individuals that need full-time caretakers to make sure that they get through their day. So it's a, uh, it's a wide array of opportunity, if you will. Um, and I think I got off pretty good. So I'm definitely not a, uh, it doesn't make, make life hard every once in a while, of course, but everyone's got hardships in their life. And, um, you know, when I look at myself compared to those around me with other disabilities, I know I've, I've got it pretty well made that I can live a pretty functional and, and, and independent lifestyle and, and know I'm okay. So. Yeah, because I was so opposed myself and I was three months for the truth. So when I was, oh, okay. re- so when I was researching your whole Sometimes, sometimes shit mark here. Yeah. But, but I, did, I did meet one of my friends uh, for a podcast a few weeks ago, and it was only a week premature. So mm. it's, it's, very, it's very unusual how things happen. Yeah, it's, exactly. Well, for the best, isn't it? It is, absolutely. My, I would consider it much a blessing more than a curse. So I know I am where I am in my life because of the disability and, you know, most of it's because I've had to learn how to work around it or work with it, if you will, right? Um, and I think that's given me a lot of opportunity, but um, I don't want to say that I avoid it, right? It's just, it's, you know, I try not to make it a focal point of my life. I try to live a daily life and live a lifestyle that I want and don't let my disability stop me from doing that. That sounds very good. That should, that should be a quote or a cushion, that. There you go, right? Yeah. yeah. Put it above the, above the stove, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and so most of your CP affects the lower body, which you've mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and in in the US, it's a lot different with the medical side of things. So I know over here we've got the NHS, thank goodness, and it's all free and all that kind of thing. So with the cerebral palsy and the sort of surgery, I'm assuming the cost was a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would. I mean, I was my last one when I was eight years old and I had three of them. So I'm obviously way over my head how much they cost. Um, but I can tell you that growing up as I got into like the middle school and high school age, um, I had a lot of physical therapy that at some points were like not like health insurance didn't want to cover it anymore. Right. I got to a point where I was like, oh, he's he could if he had to walk a quarter mile or walk a half mile. So like, why would he need a wheelchair? And it's like, what? That doesn't make any sense, right? So it was, there was a lot of battles as I got older to get new wheelchairs or to continue to make sure that insurance was paying for physical therapy visits and stuff like that to get stretched and all those things that were really essential to making sure I function well every day. Um, so that became a bit of a battle as I got older. But um, I recently, I guess not recently, but five years ago when I got my most recent wheelchair, I switched out of just the medical side of things and just went directly through a distributor um perform x who makes their wheelchair basketball chairs and sport chairs in general um they don't work with health insurance which honestly i appreciate because it just allows you a lot better convenience communications much better with them you can get parts way quicker it's it's usually a battle when you have a wheelchair that's sponsored by health insurance because it takes months on end to get even just like the simplest thing repaired or replaced like it's a battle. It's a fight. It costs way too much money and it just takes forever. It's like the least convenient thing for somebody that needs convenience, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, I wouldn't say that I'm a huge proponent of the healthcare system in the U S um, you know, the things that should be readily accessible are not, and those that shouldn't be are, and that's kind of an issue, I think. So, um, 
you know, if I can stand up there and speak my voice, I would, but I know I'm, I'm just a little pee on the whole scheme of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny because I'm just on here because I'm thinking that sounds very similar to, because we've got, we've got water services here. So we could go to the mask. But, but that take sometimes some water services in certain counties, they take forever to get back to it. So it's a lot yeah. easier just to go to this, just to boot it if you've got the contacts, then it's easy right. to do that way. Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's a problem there if I'm going to a bike shop to fix my wheelchair more than I'm going to like a wheelchair place. <laughs> you know, <laughs> clearly there's something going wrong, going wrong there. <laughs> so they're similar wheels. So I'm sure they'll consult it. Right. Yeah. They, they know how to work a spoke and an axle every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so how did you get into swimming then? Because I got down here that your coach was also your teacher. Was it, is it high school? Um, and that you said that um, the teacher said that this could be the best sport for you as women. Yeah, I mean, I you know that. that's, that's really it. So I was, like I said earlier, I, I'm the youngest of four siblings, uh, three siblings, four kids in total. And um, all three of my siblings growing up had Mr. Keller, Steve Keller. Um, he was a second grade teacher at the time that I was joining the elementary school, um, grade two. I know it's called over there. So, um, and so he knew of me well before I knew of him. And so he kind of knew from my sisters and my brother about my cerebral palsy and just my, my needs of getting around and life looking a little bit different. And so um, we're also from a small city. We're 12,000 people big here. Uh, and I was at the time the only kid in a wheelchair in school. So I kind of already, by not standing at all, I stood out quite a bit. Um, and so when Steve first met me when I was in his class, we just had an Im immediate connection. He he just took me under his wing very quickly, not because he was supposed to or not because he was told to. It was just one of those things where we have the same level of humor. We found the same interest in things. We're both big sports buffs. And, um, you know, we just felt like we shared a lot of common interests. And um, it was really cool to have somebody, you know, at such a young age, be such a role model so quickly in my life. Um, and Steve was one of many people that was such a focal point in saying, you know, your disability doesn't need to hinder you, doesn't need to slow you down from what you can achieve. Um, and so he, at the time, when I first got into his class, was just starting our local swim club. Um, I've always been a fan of the water. The water has always been a place, whether it's an ocean, the pool, the lake, whatever it may be, where I felt like my disability was never really a hinder. Um, you know, you asked me to stand on one foot in gym class and I fall over immediately. And then you ask me to do it in the pool and I can do it for days. It's almost like a superpower, right? And so um, in my wheelchair growing up and I lived on a hill, I had some pretty big arms. I had some pretty broad shoulders, even for a younger guy. And um, when I learned from Steve that swimming is something that can be done competitively, that you can go back and forth and race, you know, I was too young, I think at that point to really understand the whole context of the Olympics and what Olympic swimming looked like, right? Um, that I realized, oh, this is really cool. And then, you know, this is, this is fun to learn more about. And so um, Steve actually invited me to come try out the swim club, come see what it was all about. And it was one of the things that I fell in love with right away. I just felt like it was the first platform where my disability wasn't something that was going to slow me down. Obviously it was going to make things a little bit more difficult, right? Kicking in the water, doing the flip turns on the wall. Those things were doable, but not as fast as my able-bodied counterparts. Um, so there was a lot of learning, but and also a lot of acceptance within myself to say, hey, like put the ego aside, like just get better. You know, this is something that is really an individualized sport where your your progress is what's being measured. Um, and so it was really something that I fell in love with and just felt, again, another great way to stay connected with Steve. And so I swam through fourth grade. So I swam for a couple of years, did a lot of swim meets, really enjoyed it. Um, and then I had my last surgery. So I had to take quite a bit of time away from the water. Um, I had to relearn how to walk. I had to learn a lot of new things. So um, the water was very therapeutic for me, but it wasn't in a situation where it was best for me to train aggressively or, you know, as a competitive swimmer, it was more of just, let's get in the water for some aquatic therapy and get the legs moving again. So it was a long, long time coming before I actually got back in the water or was able to. Um, but that last surgery actually gave me the freedom to do a bit more. I was able, I was much more confident on my feet. I was stronger on my legs. And so I actually played baseball um, in middle school and didn't even touch the pool for three to four years. Um, it wasn't until high school again that I ran into Steve, um, just kind of serendipitously, just 
one of those random moments where it all lined up perfectly where I ran into him at the school. He was coaching swim practice that morning. I was at the school setting up for some school function, I believe. And um, we ended up chatting again for the first time in a long time. And I went home and I was like, I think, I think I'm gonna go back to swimming and get back into it. Um, I went and swam with our, my high school team that first year right away. And before I knew it, um, Steve had introduced me to the Paralympic organization, right? Something that we had never really known much about. We didn't know anything that was out there because again, I'm the only athlete or individual in a chair pretty much in my hometown for most of my life. And, um, so when I found swimming and we found the Paralympic organization, I was like, oh, this is the best of both worlds. Like you already have a sport that allows you to do you and be yourself. And now we have people that race in a similar situation as you do, which is great. So um, it felt very fair and equitable and like a, an opportunity for me really to compete. And before I knew it, I went to my first national in April of 2007 with Steve. And by September, I was down in Rio de Janeiro competing at the Para Pan Am Games, which was incredible. So it was, it just took off like a rocket. It was one of those things where we found immediate success. Um, the drive and the, and the commitment to the sport just elevated to an, to an, a professional level, let's be honest. And um, I just kind of felt like right there in that moment that I had found my niche. Like the, this is, this is something that I was willing to sacrifice a lot of things to make my identity. Um, was that a great thing? Sure. Short term. Yeah. Long term. Was it always the best thing? Maybe not, but you know, it's, that's part of life and learning those, those, those journeys and goals along the way. So um, yeah, I've, I'm very fortunate now to actually say that my full-time job is as a swim coach and I'm running the same cl swim club that I swam for with Steve way back when. So it's kind of been very cool to come full circle and see the, the uh, relationship grow to where it has now and we get to be colleagues and that's pretty great. Um, and so you got your 2006, I read about Japan. How was Beijing? Oh, unbelievable. And it's hard to think about the fact that I feel like I can remember like every moment of being in Asia for six weeks. And that was 15 years ago, you know, and I, I couldn't even tell you what I had for breakfast two hours ago right now. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's so cool how that's just a core memory burst in forever, but it was quite the experience, you know, um, I've been fortunate to that point to have traveled a few times internationally and done a lot of things, but uh, this was the first time where I was like, okay, I don't know a lick of the language, the dialect here. I don't know the language. I don't know what's going on. And um, the entire organization of Beijing that ran the games were incredibly hospitable. You know, everything was well organized, put together. It was thorough. We were always had what we needed. Um, accessibility was fantastic. I mean, the whole experience was something else. You know, it was a very historic um Olympic Games with Michael Phelps having won seven gold medals. You know, it was like the fact that we, the Paralympians, had to follow that up was like, all right, thanks, dude. Like, great shoes to fill. Like, come on. So, um, you know, but knowing that we were in the same water cube that history had been made and just being able to be out there, I had never really swam in front of cameras before. You know, this was the first time where I'm out marching out for finals in the 400 meter freestyle and I got cameras in my face. There's cameras on the bottom of the pool. I'm in front of 20,000 people in the stands that are going wild. And you're like, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. And I was 17 years old. I, mean, I barely knew how to drive at that point. And here I am in this big stage where it's like that whole level of stimulus and exposure was uh, something else. But again, it must have worked because I will never forget a moment of it. It was something I'm very, very proud of. And um, you know, I'm always excited to share with other people because it was a lot of hard work and it was a lot of commitment. And I think that's the more exciting part is knowing that that level of commitment and trust in your values paid off to such an extreme level, you know, and that's not something that a lot of people get to say in their lifetime. So, um, you know, in a more philosophical sense, I, I definitely appreciate that side of that. And being so young as well, only 17. So right. Another. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely different. So I had to, I had to take summer school before I went to the games because I was going to miss the first month of my my year 12, my senior year of high school, you know, before university. So it was, it was different. It was a lot. Um, but again, a sacrifice I was definitely willing to make because I knew that, you know, I was about to do something that a lot of people say they'll never, never get to achieve. So I'm very proud of that. So um, how did, how did Steve, how did he, um, because you've both said it didn't quite know much about Paralympics, but how did he manage to get in touch with them? Um, the Paralympics, I'm sorry, say that again. Sorry, like as in, 
because I misunderstood the question. Um, so um, you mentioned that you two didn't know anything much about the Paralympics or how it was stuck to. Right. How did he get into contact in the first place with? Sorry, good call. Yeah, thank you. Um, ironically, um, it all started from a movie. Remember the Titans? So Steve was watching this movie at home one night. And spoiler alert, in the movie, the star quarterback gets in a car crash. He gets T-boned and he gets paralyzed waist down. Um, the team goes on to win the championship without him as he's watching from his hospital bed. And they come and visit him after he's after the game. And, um, you know, they, he congratulates all of them. And, you know, they're all excited and they're talking about, you know, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to get through this. We're going to figure it out and kind of pans away to like the the after scenes and stuff. And they talk about how, you know, the star quarterback finds that there's athletes for people in wheelchairs. And Steve's watching this and sees this and just starts Googling it and just like realizing like, holy cow, this is actually a real thing, you know, um, special Olympics, you know, for those of mental disorders and, and stuff has always been a very commonly known thing in the United States. Like we always know that there's, that's been around that there's many organizations in every state that host fantastic events and stuff, but this isn't special Olympics, right? This is Paralympics. This is a goals for physical disabilities. And so that's not as well known, right? That's not as accessible for everybody because there's not as many individuals that are willing or have the accessibility to compete in sports in the same way. Um, and so when we found out about U.S. Paralympic swimming and just the, the opportunities that it provided, we just when we just talked about, we learned about what it was like to get classified and to make sure that I was swimming with the right category of swimmers. Um, we learned a lot about what times I needed to go, what time standards to make certain levels of meets, which was very similar to what we'd already done with swimming, you know, as an able-bodied athlete, you know, you qualify for your state level meet or your regional level meet or national level meet. So, and there's certain times you have to hit. So we knew to look for those and what those kind of meant. Um, so a lot of our experience from swimming alone just, you know, helped us get involved in, in this in a quicker sense. So yeah, I went to my, like I said, I went to my first national level meet right after my first season of high school swimming. Um, and I got classified right away and, and had a really nice first meet. Um, and a lot of the USA coaches were there and just kind of watching and learning. And, you know, as a, as a new guy on the town and they just asked questions and wanted to learn more about the rookie and what I, what I could do and what my, my availability was like. And yeah, it just kind of became something that I was folded into from a very young age and, you know, supported and very happy with how far it went. So, um, yeah, it was very, it was very cool. So, um, now that I don't swim anymore competitively, right. It's, uh, it's still cool to be able to be a part of the U S organization and still, you know, help mentor younger swimmers. I work a little bit with the, um, Paralympic committee in as far as selecting teams for international trips. Um, and I'm our Wisconsin's, um, Wisconsin swimming's, you know, as our whole delegate, I'm our disability chair. So I, I oversee and help all the Paralympic athletes within the Wisconsin system and make sure that they get what they need at swim meets and stuff, because it can be a lot when you're an able-bodied athlete or a disabled athlete swimming at an able-bodied meet. There's a couple other factors to consider. So I'm um, happy to help navigate that through my experiences. I mean, you did quite well on the national and international stage and you didn't medal, did you? In I did not medal in Beijing, no. Um, yeah. You know, for me, that was... That just getting there was icing on the cake because when I was when we were start thinking about you know I'd gone to 2007 I'd gone to the Para Pan Am Games I won six medals in seven events that I swam and it was like holy cow this is incredible but even then it was like I'm still young I'm I don't know everything yet I'm I'm still trying to figure a lot of this out by the time trials had rolled around in 2008 the next year you know six seven months later. Um, that was never really our focus. It was like, let's go to trials. Let's go experience it. Let's go see what this intense meet is like. Um, you know, cause oftentimes, and it's true, like Olympic trials, Paralympic trials can be more intense than the actual games. You know, it's, it's much more cutthroat. Only so many people are going on. And when you get there, it's like a, a celebration and a victory of achieving the highest pinnacle of sport. Um, so there's a lot of pressure, internal pressure, outside pressures that go into the trials meet. So it's just like, let's just go experience it soak it in and then by 21 or 2012 when you're 21 years old and you're much bigger faster stronger then we can actually think about qualifying for the games and i had an incredible meet in 2008 at trials and went huge best times and and did enough and it was one of those things where uh i was probably one of the last few guys selected but i was selected and it was something that we weren't expecting so really beyond that point anything that happened in beijing was icing on the cake it was 
hard to not want to put expectations on it being like, Oh my God, I made it. I qualified. Like let's start thinking about, you know, achieving the Paralympic medal status and stuff. But in the end it was like, you know, keep your, keep your cool, enjoy the expo exposure. You're about to live in Asia for six weeks by yourself. You know, it's not by yourself, but you know, under other people. And, um, it was just a lot. So, um, the fact that I even finaled was pretty cool. And it was something that by the time I got there, it was a good goal. You know, it was something that I thought was realistic and it was ironically in the event that I wasn't expecting it to, I qualified for the, the Paralympic games through my hundred backstroke, which has always been my, was always my strongest stroke. Um, but I actually ended up qualifying for finals in the 400 freestyle. So um, a bit of a twist of fate, if you will. But again, being able to be in the ready room and march out for finals and have a chance to to think about swimming for a medal was was pretty cool in itself. But um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very different to your book standard uh, dirty land trip. Um, it's a lot different from that. Um, yeah. I, and being... What happened after that? Because um, you still carried on up until 2015. Uh, yep. research, but I don't know if that's right or not. But yeah. then, so you did national and all that, but you didn't do London when the 12. No. no. So what happened there? Yeah, that was not by choice. Um, <laughs> that was that was um, in 2012. You know, like I said, it was one of those things that was always our goal. That was always our our focus was to see if we can get to London and then, and then make that the, the first Olympics Paralympics that I go to. Um, so by that time I was 21 years old, I had, you know, four years later, I was at university at this point, I was two years into university. I was studying physical therapy and working on my doctorate degree there. And, um, I had moved about six hours away from home down to a school in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I swam with the competitive D one collegiate team there and had that, that fantastic opportunity. Um, and, I um, kind of did everything I could in the moments while I was at school to get there. Um, by the fall of 2011, I was just starting my third year of university. Um, I kind of came to the realization that like, if I wanted to make it to London, I was going to have to commit myself more than I was. Not that I wasn't swimming enough or that I wasn't swimming hard enough. It was just, I needed to be in a mindset and in a, in a, atmosphere where I knew that that was the same goal as everybody else, you know, and in the college side of things, that's not always the case for a lot of people. And even my college coaches, bless their heart, you know, they're fantastic people. That's a big burden to ask of them and be like, Hey, I know you're so focused on the college season, but I need to look beyond this too and say, Hey, I have some larger goals that go beyond our school walls. And so um, I came to the realization that going home and training with Steve in 2012 was the best choice prior to trials. Um, so I went home, I left school for a year and I just trained my heart out. I swam twice a day. I went to the weight room. I was just taking advantage of every recovery opportunity I could and just putting myself in the best situation to be successful. Um, I went to Olympic trial, Paralympic trials in June of 2012 and going into that quad, I should say that every four years, right. That compared to Beijing. We were able to take significant, we are only allowed to take a smaller number of men to the games compared to 20, 2008. In 2008, we were able to take 20 men. And in 2012, we were only able to take 11. And so, um, or I guess that maybe it was 12, excuse me, 12 and 12. That's right, 12 and 12. But um, we lost eight slots in that, in that quad because we had a lot of, you know, older veteran swimmers in 2008 who called that games their last one they retired. And they were medal winners and stuff like that. And their shoes were very big to fill. And so, you know, a lot of us did our parts, but we didn't have maybe the foundational background underneath it to help, you know, keep the keep the pipeline moving. So we lost a lot of spots just based on that. Um, and so I just made the selection criteria that much harder for who qualified for the games. And um, so I went to trials and I swam best times. I did everything that I could. Um, within the U.S. system, if you end up top three in the world in your event at Olympic trials, then or Paralympic trials, you would then qualify for the team. It's like an automatic berth, right? Um, well, we're still a very strong team, even though we're a little bit smaller than we have in the past. And 
we had, I believe, like eight or nine of the men that were selected were top three in the world already after trials. And so right there and then you're like, OK, well, now it's down to a few guys. I was very fortunate to finish fifth of the world at the time, the 100 backstroke. And I'm thinking like, hey, this is, you know, I'm going to make it to finals. It would be so good for, you know, really fighting for a medal this time around in finals. And um, the nine, uh, 10th, 11th and 12th guys selected were fourth in the world. They were all people that had statistically proven that they would be closer to meddling than I was based on time differences. And um, it came down to about one one hundredth. I was about one one hundredth away from being selected from the team. So my whole life flipped upside down. It was one of those things that I was not expecting. I was really committed to going and really feeling like there was no other choice. It was either, you know, we go to London or bust. And unfortunately, we busted. And so it quite quickly altered my life, my plans and everything. Um, I ended up transferring colleges because I wasn't allowed to go back um, based on the agreement that I had with my leave. You know, I decided sign a contract that says, you know, I'm going to come back in a calendar year and re resume my, my scholarship and my education at that point. Uh, when I didn't make it, I was like, well, can I come back a semester early? Can I come back, you know, in the fall instead of the spring? Um, if I did that, I would have lost, it would have breached our contract and I would have lost my scholarship. And that was the thing I was willing to afford. And so then it kind of became one of these questions of like, what do I do for four to five months? Like, I don't have a job. I don't want to swim. I don't want to, I can't go back to school. Like, where do I go? Um, so there was a little, there's some, some dark times for sure. There was a lot of uncertainty and struggle and shoulda, coulda, wouldas and, um, you know, probably a little bit, I don't want to say too much self-pity, but you know, it was a, it was kind of almost a grieving process, right? I would poured my entire life into this and this was not the result that I expected from the efforts that I put in. So, um, I was fortunate enough that Steve helped me find a local coaching job with one of the high schools in the area, which quickly reinvigorated my passion for the sport and um, got me wanting to swim again, but it really got me wanting to coach. And that was the biggest thing. So I ended up wanting to alter my life around so that I could make coaching a focal point of my life, but still have a full-time job and, and make it all work out. So I ended up transferring to a local university, uh, Marquette University, and I got my elementary education degree. So I wanted to go be a teacher and I knew that if I taught all morning and early afternoon, I could go after school and go coach in the evenings. I could still swim. And I kind of felt like a moment, like the perfect triangle of like everything I was looking for. So it was a big life switch. It was a lot more than I was expecting, but um, you know, it turned out great. And it's uh, allowed me to get my fire back for the water. And then I got back in the water in 2013 and swam a few more years um, while I finished my degree. And then by the time 2015 rolled around the end of 2015, it was Finishing, I was finishing my education degree and I was getting ready to go and find my own classroom and be a licensed teacher. And the pragmatics of life kind of took over in that moment, whereas I said to myself, like, you know, if I try and qualify for Rio and go back in 2016 and have this big redemption song that, you know, 2012 was a fluke, am I really ready to sacrifice my long term goals at that point and say, like, hey, I want to you know, be a teacher in a stable classroom and start building a really nice, you know, life for myself and the pragmatics kind of won and said, you know what, I've done a lot of great things and I've had a lot of great success in the sport. Uh, it's brought me everything that has led me to where I am today. And I'm so fortunate for that. And I think that was enough of a high for me to say like, no, I think I'm okay. You know, calling it a career, hanging up a suit. And so I ended up deciding just to go into the professional lifestyle and keep coaching, teach, you know, and do all those things that I had really found a new passion for um, that, you know, kept me dry a little bit more often. So um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big life switch, but it was one that I think, uh, it's hard for me to fathom where I'd be right now in life. If I didn't do that, you know, if, if the one one hundredth of a second didn't dictate my entire life, um, you know, I can't fathom having a life different than what I have now. And I'm very fortunate and blessed with all the opportunities that have come my way. And I really, truly love waking up every morning and doing what I'm doing, you know, coaching athletes in the CrossFit sphere and coaching athletes in the pool and, and doing all of that is something that I really, really enjoy because, it's people like myself that I had, you know, coaches growing up that have instilled that passion in me and instilled that fire that potential is limitless and that we can always achieve if we're willing to put ourselves into that position and, and push beyond the barriers we set for ourselves. And that message has allowed me to do so much with my life. And I want to make sure I'm giving that back as much as I possibly can. And coaching is the best avenue to do that. And it's really, really something I enjoy. You started to stop later than 2015, 2016. I don't want to take the chance of 
to win it again, which, you know, is understandable. You would spend all that. Um, and so you decided to do, after London, just stick with it and do nationals and some internationals, but not Paralympic star. Um, how was that coming back? Coming back from that disappointment of London to be able to start up again until 2015. Yeah, um, it was interesting. I think, well, one, it took a long time for me to just kind of digest the disappointment I had in myself, you know. And I think anybody around you would tell tell you that, like, they were incredibly proud of me, that there was something that they were disappointed in me for. It was all like I did everything I could, you know, and it was one of the the hardest lessons with the sport. And it's one of the things that's tough as a coach too, is, you know, you see a kid train really hard all year and they go to their big championship meet at the end of the year and it doesn't go well. Like, so I mean, that's, that's just one of the natures of the beast. It's one of those things where it, you just can't plan it like that sometimes. Like you can't always just assume that a success is going to come around that it's a very, very, very patient sport. Right. And it's just, it may not be there in the present moment, but at some point it's going to pay off. It's going to work out for you. So, um, it was a lot. It was a lot to digest because I just had made so many sacrifices into, you know, long-term life things that had, you know, to, to be in the short-term focus, right. That it was shocking when it didn't work out because there was a lot of assurance in my mind that said, you know, as long as I make it to the games, my life will pick up like it did when I left, you know, I can go back to school a year later and start up like nothing ever happened. It's just a year later, but I got a really cool experience in between. And so when that didn't happen, it was just this big moment of like, not only like bummer, I'm disappointed that I didn't make it, but it was also a lot of turmoil of like, what have I just done for the rest of my life? Like, I've just, I've just changed everything. I've moved the needle in a way that I wasn't expecting. And so I got really nervous about like, where do I go from here? And like the insecurities of that were a lot for me to balance. Um, because I had also lost confidence in myself. I'd lost the ability to say like, yeah, I can do it. I can make things happen because in that moment, I didn't, I didn't do enough. I didn't, I, you know, it was a lot of shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, as I got back in the water, because I just needed some outlet, I needed a way to, you know, keep my body moving and just, you know, find a way to restart. It turned into a lot of understanding that like, that was out of my control. Like I can't control how fast those around me swam. I can't control, you know, what my competitors are doing on a daily basis. All I can do is control what I have, you know, and what's in front of me. And so I know I have, best support systems I've ever had, you know, that anybody could have, they've been incredible. And they, you know, though I don't see my, I don't see Steve as my coach anymore, right? He's still somebody that's an integral part of my life and somebody that I'm very proud to work with every day, but all those memories still live on, you know, and and the coach that he is, is somebody that I wish for everybody. And I want to be for everybody too. Um, But he, you know, he and all our staff and my parents, my family, my, my teammates, it was all an understanding of like, you know, I went in and did the absolute best that I could. And that's all that I got to be understanding of and saying like, you know, I did everything that I could. And the outcome wasn't great. It wasn't the one that we were looking for. But at the end of the day, I did find progress. I went best times. I'd gone faster than I ever have. So it means what I was doing was doing something right. It's just hard when the obvious progress we want to see is this big shiny thing right in front of us, not the little things behind it. So it was kind of restructuring the framework to say, you know, what am I in control of? What do I have the ability to control these next couple of years? And really what, what, what more of a statement can I make at this point? And what lessons can I learn in myself if I take this horrible heartbreak and say, you know what, this is fuel rather than, you know, burning the, burning the house down. It's saying, you know, how can I build this tall, another story on this house? And so, um, I just went in with that belief that, you know, I was still seen as somebody that was, you know, an asset to Team USA and somebody that could provide some great opportunities and and be, you know, maybe it was more about my, it wasn't about my swimming as much for me and my son mine, but being a better teammate. And it was better about, about being a better leader and, um, you know, just showing that a team is only the as great as our weakest link. And I don't want to be that weakest link, you know, and that doesn't mean that to be faster than everybody else. It just means I have to show enough support and commitment and passion towards what I do that everybody else feels that same way, you know? And so, um, by 2013, I had really found a groove again. I had qualified for the Pan Pacific championships, 
you know, A level status meets that made me feel like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm swimming well, like the way that I'm, I want myself to be, and just found a good groove for a couple of years. You know, it was very fortunate to qualify for some high level meets, um, be team captain a few times of certain meets, and just know that like that was what was important to me was that you know I was making an impact more than just in the water, but on the deck and outside the pool and making sure that everyone felt like they had what they needed and, you know, being a leader in the sense of we have to do this together. It's a very individual sport, but when you go to a team team event like that, where you're representing the stars and stripes or your country, you know, you have to go put your team on your back and you have to do it for your team and put your team first. Um, and that's really vaulted me into what I really, you know, preach as a coach too, is that, we do a lot of things individually and in that we work to strive for better internal success, but you know, that's only shadowed by what we do for our teammates as well. You know, how do we use our success and our progress and what we do towards how we can help our community, you know, and that's been uh, really cool to have that turnaround where it really helped my mindset believe that I can only do as much as I can control. And I'm going to let that be my focal point as I, you know, take every stroke in the water. Um, and if you ever think back and feel like what life would have been if you didn't uh, take that near off and have stayed in college, you know, what life would have been like? Yeah, you know, I would, uh, I would not be a coach. I know that. I think I would have gone back into, I would have gone back to school the next year. I would have gone and finished my physical therapy degree. I would have hoped to take that into a sports realm. You know, I've always been a very big sports guy. So, you know, whether it was working in athletic rehab centers or if it was working with a professional team at some point as a PT, like I could tell that was something I was really striving to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I would not have found, I don't think I would have, I wouldn't have coached swimming the way that I do now. You know, I would have maybe done it a couple more summers while I was still swimming in college to help out or enjoy that side of it. But um, yeah, I probably would have been working a normal nine to five and you know, not doing anything CrossFit related and who knows, I'd have no idea, but, um, you know, I, I probably would have been happy. I probably, I would probably have been content if I had finished my degree and, and enjoying that. I have a big passion for, you know, the human body and physiology and fitness and everything that moves with it, because I've learned so much through the experiences I've had in a physical therapy clinic myself to see like, here, here's how you can work through this and how you can adapt to things. And so that's always been a fascinating uh, subject for me, but, um, you know, I, I also found that I've been able to rekindle that through my life now, you know, which is really cool. So it may not be with an official doctorate that says I'm a physical therapist, but as a coach in multiple realms, it's it's really cool to say that I'm helping people in the same way that I think I envisioned myself before the, you know, the, the, the uh, what do you want to call it? The thunderous 100th of a second changed my life. <laughs> so. And, and you can pass on your knowledge to the new generation. Right. So exactly yeah yeah and i think that's the biggest thing is it's um i found a way to be able to repay all that i've done and th those that have what have, those have done for me right you know the steves my parents um families friends teammates whatever maybe the way i can say thank you is by giving back what i've been given you know and i think that coaching lifestyle is very a very easy place to do that and so i love that um before we go further on into your life now yeah. Um, was there any challenges or any difficulties in your in your life in regards to you know you have been in your wheelchair or you walking around or anything like that? You know, like high school, you know, a lot of people say a lot of bullying or a lot of bantery type stuff has happened. Uh but I didn't know how it was for you. How was it? Um, you know, overall pretty good. I, I don't have a lot to complain about. Well, that's for sure. Um, you know, like I said, I come, I come from a small town where everybody kind of knows everybody in that situation. And so um, I think very quickly people knew who I was because, well, I have three, three older siblings. So they've heard the Miazga name thrown around quite a bit already. And all my siblings played high school sports and middle school sports and did quite well for themselves. And um, so it was just kind of like, I fell in the line of like, Oh yeah, we know who the Miazgas are. Oh yeah. We know who Tom is, but um, you know, I'm very fortunate that I've never really let my wheelchair, my disability be the um, first assumption of somebody, right? I've always allowed my personality and my 
um, you know, even just a friendly smile be the first thing to say, hey, and I'm, that's, that's, I think, probably more than I needed to, right? I think I've, I've maybe tried too hard sometimes and still tries too hard sometimes to make that the purpose, um, you know, and just instead of letting the wheelchair be or letting, letting my, my disability, you know, be out there and vulnerable, it's, it's just always trying to, I don't want to say putting on a front, but making sure that a certain part of me is always present, right? Um, and my personality. So I had a little bit of trouble in middle school, you know, just boys being boys and just people not understanding everything, you know, and just, just, it's easy to compare when you're young because you don't know any better and you just see what somebody else has and you want it too, or you see somebody really good at one sport. So you want to be good at that too. And so it's just tough when people, you know, they see you in a wheelchair and they don't really understand what you're going through because for myself, it might've been a blessing and a curse that like I was able to live a pretty normal life. Like I didn't let it slow me down. So when people saw that I couldn't do things, you know, they didn't think twice that like, um, you know, he's disabled, we can't pick on him. Like I lived myself to the fullest and I lived my life like I normally would want anybody else to live theirs. And so they treated me the same way, right? You know, so if somebody's picking on me, right? They're gonna pick on me because that's how I that's how I hold myself. Like I I wanna be a you know, a younger uh, a kid that just lives life as it is. So um, you know, I couldn't take any of that too seriously. It, it got tough sometimes, of course, because yeah, I didn't understand why they thought that was okay, but I probably let it on to myself. I wanted to be treated normal. I wanted to be seen like everybody else. And so they treated me like everybody else, you know, and that's, that's okay. Um, as I've gotten older and as I got older, there's a lot of people that, you know, make assumptions rather than ask questions about why I'm in a wheelchair or don't understand how I can be in a wheelchair, but still walk. And, you know, some of these misnomers that, you know, you have to be paralyzed to be in a wheelchair or things like that. Um, and of course there's, there's times where it's like, all right, well, you know, I don't see wheelchair entrance into this building and I have to walk up these stairs or, you know, I have to get out of my chair and do this instead, or I have to be in my feet and carry this somewhere. And that always feels a little, you know, vulnerable. And, you know, even to this day, it's still something that I maybe struggle with a little bit where, where it's like, Oh, like I'm showing off my walking and how, you know, elaborate and, and wild it can look, you know, and that's just putting me in a different light than most people see me. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow therapy of, yeah. being okay with people making assumptions of you and, and looking at you and not letting their judgment dictate how your life needs to go. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, I've, I, again, have a great support system. It's, it's, you know, I have a lot of acquaintances in life and I love it. And I think it's great that I can say hi to a lot of people and know a lot of people, but I also have, you know, my five, six people that I keep really close to me that, you know, that's my inner circle that, you know, have always been a tremendous support for me. And, um, you know, when I'm with them, I always feel safe. I feel comfortable. I feel confident. So um, I've got it pretty good for sure. <laughs> yeah. I just have no those Cowans. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into CrossFit? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so when I retired from swimming, I was finishing up my student teaching semester in university where you know, they throw you into a classroom to kind of practice being a teacher. There's the actual licensed teacher in the room, but you're in the room kind of learning, you know, the daily flow of things, how to work with kids, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so as I was finishing that, you know, and started to apply for my own teaching jobs and getting into my own schools and stuff, um, I just knew I needed to find a way to keep my body moving. You know, being in my wheelchair, I wanted to make sure that I could still get up and walk around the classroom easily. I could get around, the, you know, during recess, I could you know, just make sure I was ready for anything. Right. Um, and when I left swimming, I went from, you know, swimming 10 to 12 times a week to not at all. And so my hips were getting a lot of work the same way that they had been. Um, you know, the water brought a lot of great core stability and, and body alignment that I wasn't getting anymore. And so, um, I had to find something to just keep me moving. And I started at Globo gyms and just kind of like find finding machine stuff to keep me moving. I'm like, I have enough experience within physical therapy to say like, Hey, I'll just go do these exercises and go do this. And maybe I'll be better for it. But I was the competitor in me and the, and the athlete in me wanted something more than that. Right. So I was very fortunate that our local gym, our local CrossFit affiliate was pretty close to home. I didn't uh, know much about CrossFit. I'd seen a couple of videos online and, you know, maybe there weren't the best examples of what CrossFit could be, but we were really lucky in that the sense that when I joined the gym, um, we had a neighboring physical therapy clinic right next to it. And so I actually started over there, kind of got set up, 
worked on some basic old foundational things to kind of get me moving again, feeling good. And then very shortly after I got set up with one of the trainers in the CrossFit gym and we just started continuing to build on the, uh, you know, the hip movements and the leg, leg function that we had been working on. And to the point where it got to be like, Hey, let's actually try this CrossFit workout today. Let's, let's join the class. Let's do what they're doing and let's see how it goes. And I totally fall in love with it. I am a, uh, I'm weird in the sense that I, I love being sore. <laughs> I, I love working hard and putting my effort into everything that I do. Because when you wake up the next day and you feel soreness, that's your body learning that like, hey, you push yourself more than you thought you could. And you went to new lengths and you learned that you uh, can achieve more. Um, that, feels, that philosophy is something that's always been fun for me and motivating for me. And it's like a reward. It's, a, it's the weirdest reward that there is, but it's a great one. And uh, so I had found that a lot in swimming. You know, I woke up plenty of times sore and stiff from swimming. And when, you know, after my first week in a CrossFit gym, when I was waking up sore and stiff again, I was like, I have a feeling that my whole experience at the pool is now about to, you know, come back to life now in a gym, you know? And so um, having the experience that I've had in the Paralympic organization, I now knew to go and be like, hey, I know I'm in an able-bodied atmosphere and environment that is not necessarily geared towards people in wheelchairs yet. So let's go see if it exists. So I went on and I Googled and found, you know, is there CrossFit for adaptive athletes? Is there a, you know, a way for wheelchair athletes to compete in CrossFit? And I found the Wheelwad organization. And so Wheelwad has been the grassroots movement towards everything adaptive CrossFit, functional fitness. Um, they have a numerous number. I think it's up to now 16 different adaptive divisions very similar to how swimming works. So, you know, you're only competing against those that have a similar abilities to you, which is great, you know? And um, so I've, again, found a new niche in a way that allowed me to feel like, not only was I getting like, you know, in the, in the pool, you're getting faster and you're getting better at swimming. Within the CrossFit gym, now not only are you getting better and becoming a, you know, fitter competitor, you're enhancing your daily lifestyle a lot more. You're increasing your functionality around your home. You're increasing your level of independence. And there's, there's so many elements of that and that level of strength that you find that you would never find anywhere else and so that's why i'm a huge proponent for crossfit because it has literally altered my life it has changed my life for the better um and i feel like even at the age of 32 right now when i'm 42 and i'm still doing crossfit i'll still be able to function the same way right i'll still be able to be somebody that can you know get around the house and you know hopefully if i have kids someday that i'll be able to pick them up and take them wherever i need to go and and my wheelchair my disability won't slow me down from that and I really owe that to CrossFit. So, um, yeah, I fell in love with it. And I immediately started finding competitions in CrossFit. Um, the CrossFit Open is, um, you know, the very first stage to any athlete qualifying for the CrossFit Games. But also seen as a really cool community benchmark where anybody at the gym can do this. You make it a really fun night at the gym and everybody's doing the workout together. And you're tracking your scores and your progress from year to year to see if you've gotten fitter and better. And so it's it's fun to see that. and. Um, I just fell in love with that. And uh, yeah, I, I think the athlete in me took over again and really enjoyed it to where I was able to compete on the highest level in the CrossFit sphere within my first year, which was pretty cool. And I'm very proud now to say that I am the seven time fittest seated man on earth, having won the CrossFit wheel wide games the last seven years in a row. So <laughs> you're not that at all. You look like that. I'm pretty sure everyone says to you, you look a lot younger than 32. Oh, oh man, I, I kept the I kept the scruff just to make sure that because when I shave, I look like I'm 14. So don't worry. Yeah, yeah. 32. Don't worry, my bones feel it sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> um yeah, um, you you mentioned in an article somewhere about CrossFit, uh, that you said that you felt that you had to prove yourself more than just mm. your wheelchair ability. And I just wanted to ask why. Did you feel like you had to prove yourself a bit more? I think what's tough is when you don't meet societal norms, like there's immediately a shadow cast upon you or there's a perception about you that isn't fair, right? And usually they're good and usually they're fine. But like if you see somebody that's disabled, you're going to often think that they need help, right? And that you should, you should go and be nice and you should help them and do whatever they're doing. I am not going to say no to that ever. Like I'm going to be polite and say, Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you for offering all that stuff. But oftentimes when somebody asks, they're going to slow me down because I've done it so many times. I've been so rehearsed in it that like, I know how to do it as the most efficient way possible. And so when somebody asks you to help, like you're actually might not be helping as much as you think. Um, 
I just have never wanted my disability to be the reason that people like me or that feel like they need to, you know, say hi to me or feel pity for me. Um, like I said, CP comes in many different forms and, and levels of severity, and I'm pretty fair off. I know my walking looks quite ornate. It looks very different, but I can live a, num a normal life where there are a lot of individuals that have CP that cannot, you know, and I will never take that for granted. So I, I want to live my life as fully and as opportunistically as I can. I think I just made up a word, but um, I, I want to make sure um, that I, I live the life that I want. And so I don't want people to see my wheelchair and say, he's not able to do this. He can't do this. Or, you know, why does he think he should do this? You know, and that's, that's never been something I think anybody would want them to be cast upon, right? You know, even if I were to let's say a woman, you know, I wouldn't want somebody to say like, oh, she's a woman. She can't be a CEO. She can't be in charge of things. She can't run things. You know, it's, it's very similar. We all have, I don't want to say like, I, we're a minority, right? Disabilities are very prevalent and they're very out there. And some people might see this as a minority. Sure. But I think it's just a feature of my lifestyle, you know, and that's not something I, I define as who I am. Right. So, um, I just felt like I wanted to show that not only am I capable of doing more, but hopefully it's a message for everybody else that they're capable of more too. You know, things may be hard. Life has its struggles. Everything can be difficult at times, but it's really making sure that you're able to understand that if you're allowing to take your ego out of things and realize that, okay, this is a situation that I'm in and this is what I have to accept right now and build a stepping stone path towards getting to where you want to be, then it's possible. And just because it looks different doesn't mean it's wrong, right? I was very fortunate when I got my first teaching job that I was teaching math and I loved teaching math. I'm a numbers guy. I'm all about it. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to get to the right answer doing different methods, right? And it's the very same thing in life. I can get up a set of stairs by having to carry my wheelchair on my back and walk up slow or take it step by step. And there's somebody that has no issues at all, can take every third step and run up the steps or skip up the steps. We're still getting to the top. We're still getting there. It's a, I have to accept that maybe I have to do it a little bit slower than somebody else. And that's fine because there are other elements of my life that I can do faster than other people and do them better than other people as well. You know, and so I'm, you know, I had to take my licks where I can, but also flaunt what good things I have to at the same time. And I just don't want anybody to believe that my wheelchair or my disability is going to be something that says I cannot, you know. And so when I go to the gym and I, I work out, I feel that empowerment. I know that I'm doing the best that I can with the situation that I'm in. I'm able to find internal progress. And I'm also learning how to, you know, I've learned how to do some pretty cool things that I shouldn't, you know, in fact, I can pop out of my wheelchair and walk on my hands and do all that stuff. And, yeah. you know, it's things that people wouldn't expect. Right. But that's, again, me saying, hey, I know I can't walk very well on my feet, but I have very strong shoulders and I have, a, you know, my arms are long and they can support me pretty well. So maybe we can do this. And it was a slow, progressive learn of how do we get there? How do we get to that point where we can walk on our hands? And now it's something that I do all the time. You know, it's pretty cool. So it's just, it's, it's that patience game in life that we don't all necessarily yeah. look at right away. You know, we, we, we see what we want to achieve and we see where we need to go, but we don't know how to necessarily get there sometimes. Yeah. Well, I, I just tend to just make a joke of it and just say, I'm, I'm always legless, even when I'm drunk. So <laughs> I don't lose my legs. So that's a yeah. so. Right. I love it. And so in CrossFit, I researched a little bit of it. Obviously, I've heard of it in this country. Um, sure. Over there, there seems to be quite a specific category that you're in. Uh, so you've got neuromuscular, upper extremity, and lower extremity adaptive mm -hmm. division. Yeah. Uh, quite a mouthful for, for, for a group, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot that goes on with it but in the sense of creating equitable opportunity right i mean we don't want necessarily an adaptive athlete of let's say my nature who's a seated athlete a seated with hip function athlete to compete against somebody that's having you know is a can seen as an upper extremity right upper extremity meaning that there's an impairment to their arm maybe they're missing half their arm maybe they have a completely missing arm maybe it's brachial plexus issue whatever it may be it's like if you send us on a five meet, a 5k run, I'm going to get dusted by the individual that's in an upper extremity division because they can run on two legs far faster than I can push five mile, 5k, right? Um, that's just the nature. Unless it's downhill, then maybe I win, but for the most part, I'm going to lose, right? And so 
it's creating those divisions so that people are competing against like abilities. It allows you to create better standards and make sure that you're holding people accountable for what they can do given their certain their circumstances. Um, it's a lot. It can be a lot to digest and try and figure out. But you know, the the group that and in Wheelwad and and the organization uh, organization itself does a great job of onboarding all of their athletes to make sure that they feel comfortable and ready to be in the division that they are in, and they understand why they're in the division, right? Um, I could be seen as somebody that's in the neuromuscular division. I just totally understand that. I have cerebral palsy. There's a lot of people in the neuromuscular division that have cerebral palsy as well. But again, it comes down to like the level of severity of the disability. I'm somebody that can stand up. I can walk around. I can do pull-ups from a full hang. I can, you know, jump onto a set of rings if I have to. But the moment you ask me to push a barbell overhead with 150 pounds on it, on my feet, everyone around me is dead, including myself. Because I don't have the balance. I don't have the wherewithal to hold that over my head based on my my skeletal structure and phys yeah, my physiology underneath me, where there are some people with cerebral palsy that have that ability. They are so strong on their feet. That, you know, even though there's a little bit of tremor or a little bit of wobble, they they feel comfortable and safe in that atmosphere. Yeah. And I don't. So that's where like weightlifting for me makes more sense in my wheelchair. And it's the safest approach for me to do it. So um, being in the seated with hip function is what makes sense for me. So, you know, I think it'd always be a really cool endeavor for me to try and compete in the neuromuscular division. You know if i was allowed to use my chair in certain parameters but um i also know that it may not be the healthiest thing for me either it could be a, it could bring in safety concerns that you know we shouldn't have to deal with in the first place so and uh, within that crossfit you you are the crossfit fittest seated male seven times so mm -hmm. yes sir that's quite an achievement yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Like I said, it was the the swimmer in me, the competitor in me didn't want to die, apparently, when I hung up the suit. And so finding this new outlet was something that just allowed me to rekindle that fire and keep it burning. Um, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. I've found a great opportunity in competition, but it really revolves around the passion that I have for CrossFit because it, it truly has changed my life, right? I mean, it's one of those things that I feel, I feel healthy i feel what health can feel like and i can tell you even when i swam i thought going across the gym for the first time that i would be fit i'd be able to do everything i'd be in there i have a huge cardio from all my swimming background right i was floored on my first week i was crushed like i felt so out of shape and i couldn't believe it right and to see myself grow as i have and, and learn more about my body and be more in tune with the idea of nutrition and recovery and all of those things that are so easily taken for granted with so many processed foods out there and people working way too many hours, guilty as charged. But like, you know, just, just there's so many elements of life that we can control better that CrossFit's taught me to learn to, to do. Um, that's made me feel like a better human, you know, and I love that. So um, the competitive side is great. I enjoy it because it does help set a barrier and a tone of like what's possible. You know, we don't need to put a, a cast a burden on able, uh, adaptive athletes and say like they're not able to do things like, like CrossFit's, CrossFit is the best place to learn that you actually can because every movement that we do in a gym is able to be adapted to meet the stimulus of the workout, right? Yeah. If I were to ask an able-bodied athlete to go and grab a bar and back squat, the same thing I would do for a seated athlete is a bench press, yeah. right? We're using the same major muscles that are our main source of locomotion right? We're working them to get them stronger and healthier. And we'll get the same kind of pump by doing the different movements, but achieving the same level of stimulus. So, um, you know, there's a lot that's, um, you know, the, the titles are cool and it's fun and I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I'll never take it for granted, but I'm proud of them because I can say that for seven years in a row, I've gotten better because the competition in the field is getting stronger and stronger. And I found a way to adapt to that and still be able to prove that I'm able to do it, you know, and that's what's been really neat about that is that I know I'm getting fitter. I know I'm getting better and stronger. And the fact that I'm getting older and still doing it is kind of a cool thing too, right? It's not like I'm getting younger and it's getting easier for me. I'm getting older. Life's getting busier. Life is harder. My bones don't want to wake up as well as I do sometimes. And then it's just like, you know, how's it going to work out? But it's been uh, it's been a fun ride. So you, you start. I'm not sorry. Towards the end of that, I was I was counting how many how far back that was. So you started down two thousand and seventeen. I did. Yep. Yep. So I'll just um and the seven times is that the seven times champion is that 
of course, all of America, or was that just a certain part, like your seven, your son's arm went up in your country, or was it worldwide? Whole world, baby. It's the whole world. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, so this oh. is the, 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 the CrossFit Games in which you go to, the adaptive CrossFit Games are the pinnacle of the sport, very similar to the Olympics or the Paralympics, right? Where there's multiple levels towards qualifying to getting there. And so the very first level is a universal thing where everybody from every country that wants to participate can join. And then we take it down to the top 25 athletes from there. And then at the next level, the top 25 gets cut down to the top 10, who then compete live in person. And there could be guys from the U.S. and Canada to France and South Africa and Australia. So, yeah, at the end of those competitions, I've uh, I've stood atop the podium the last seven times. So seven years in a row, that includes the whole pandemic, I'm assuming. It does, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know, was it online? Was it ever been... As it yep. was, more space style, you know, how did it work? Yeah, it was online. So uh, a lot of our competitions leading up to that adaptive CrossFit Games level are online. So we actually start, the 2024 season starts in a couple of weeks. Uh, we start with that first entry level towards qualifying um, in a, two weeks, actually, from tomorrow. So, um, uh, no, one week. Nope, two weeks. Sorry, Matt. Well, um, <laughs> um, it would have been like two months, two months apart. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so leap day, February 29th is when we start. Um, but either way, that's um that's the first level. And so that's always online. That's something that everybody does online. And then the next level is still online, the semifinal level. So you'll you know tape yourself working out, you'll show all the standards while you're working out. Um, you'll submit the video for review, submit your scores to a leaderboard. It'll all get approved, or maybe they make adjustments to your scores based on things they see in the video. Um, and then they'll select the top, you know, however many, 10, 15, whatever it may be in your division to go on to the actual on-site games. So in 2020, you know, the big year of the, the pandemic, yeah. everything was online. Everything was pretty much shut down. Um, and so we only had the open level, the very first level of the CrossFit Games that year. There was hope and plans to try and work, make it work out that we could do an online games. Um, even on the annual body, body side of CrossFit, they only had five people competing in person at the games. So it was a very small elite uh, elite status thing where they were still really spread out. They were out in the open air most of the time when they did it. So um, it was just hard to think that that was going to be possible with so many different divisions. You still have so many people there that it wasn't didn't make sense to try and make it work. And with people coming from so many different countries too you're like <laughs> how are you going to avoid the spread of this by bringing people from all over the world together in the same place so yeah everything was online those couple of years um and then by 21 was 21 yeah 21 we were back in live person games and venues so yeah and with you have a pool you weren't really fun presumably you are under the vulnerable part but um it, it didn't did you ask like for a bit longer? Like, I know in the UK we had a much longer period of isolation and lockdown. I don't know what it was like for you in America. Yeah. Um. No, our world shut down over here like March of 2020. Um, and I was at the point where they said like, I still remember like getting the emails about like, hey, like schools will be closed until Easter break, which was like three weeks away. We're like, what is happening? Gone. Like. Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden it was like, Hey, just an update. Schools are closed indefinitely. And you're like, what is happening? So like all of a sudden everybody went virtual and everyone's doing everything online. And nobody's leaving their house. And like, you can't even go to the grocery store. I mean, it's wild. It was wild. It was so, it's so hard for me to comprehend that the entire world shut down as it did. Um, but we were in lockdown, I would say for probably eight to nine months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, we were fortunate that um, a um, lot of it, um, and it was it was like a semi release. So like in the next like the next school year, for instance, um, kids didn't go back every day and they like they were at home sometimes. And so it was kind of like a slow, slow trickle back into the world. Um, so it was it was very interesting being cooped up for so long, you know, a lot of walks, a lot of outside time when you could and you know, just driving around to get away, but, you know, still having to wear a mask everywhere you go. It was, it was a lot to adjust to for all of us. And is that just in Wisconsin? Because I've heard 
um, that a lot of the states have their own rules of how things. Yep. So that was just purely for your. Yeah, yeah, we aren't as um populated or our per capita situation yeah. is as dense as maybe like L.A. or New York. So those those cities way out in the coast and stuff, and those major cities were shut down much longer than we were. So um, way stricter rules and um yeah we kind of we had us we we were pretty tight about it but again not not to that extent so yeah but all i heard from the united states was the whole election stuff so i yeah. don't hear much about anything else but not, not my cup of tea i'll say that much mm -hmm. <laughs> last couple of questions now is um with your with Sammy palsy and the way you've lived your life to thus far um, and of course, in the, the states where things aren't always one hundred percent with all the that's going on, um, what advice would you give someone else that was in a similar situation? Probably not in the same situation as him. Don't know where the suppose you came from in the first place. But right, right. what advice would you give that person? Um. I an easy quote that I've often said to myself that my mom told me way back when uh, was hustle while you wait. And that's been something that's stuck with me for a long time. There's, there's going to be a lot of times where we're not understanding why things are happening. And there's certain places where, you know, it's easy to feel left out or that you're going to be vulnerable in a situation based on disability or you're a, what you can do. And um, you just got to keep pushing through those because the right time for all that to blossom will show itself. So it's, you know, trusting the process and it's making sure that you're giving it your absolute best when you can. And just knowing that it's going to work out though it may take some time to find it, right? It might be one of those situations where you don't expect it to happen. And I can tell you that's very much been the situation for me as well. I never expected to find CrossFit the way that I have after swimming, you know, and even the life that it's allowed me to leave now, lead now. It's just been something that's been continuing to blossom by putting in hard and the time the commitment to it so um you know trust in yourself trust in your abilities for sure but the moment we give up is the moment that we realize that we've regretted what we, we could regret what we do you know and i don't want that to ever be the case so i never i really never quit it's easy to get frustrated at times and i can be an emotional guy and you know sometimes you know let my emotions get the best of me like we all do but for the most part you know it's if you trust in what is there in front of you like it's there for a reason, right? The, the hardships we deal with and the, the adversities that we have to face every day, as simple as, you know, you're running late, you woke up late on accident and it's just throwing everything off or, you know, yeah, you, you forgot you had to stop and get something on the way home and now you don't have it. Like those little things, yeah, but like they may happen for a reason that you don't know. So just keep pushing through and keep doing what you have to do and it'll pay off. And any tips? Um, because obviously in the US, things are not different other job countries is there any tips that you would advise people supposed to go through in in america in particular um yeah i think the biggest thing is be honest with yourself right there's probably a lot of things that may be difficult to do you know there's a lot of things and there's a lot of times where i maybe try and push myself harder than i have to for instance you know, there are days where my legs just don't want to come with me. Like they, I will say one thing and my legs be like, nope, we are tired. We're beat up. Like we're just, we're just one of those days. Right. And so thinking about going up some stairs or doing, you know, getting somewhere and having to, um, you know, go a long distance to get there. It's just like, Hey, if it's not there today, you got to be honest with yourself and it's, you know, take the wheelchair or find a different route and, and being okay with that because, with my cerebral palsy, and I think for a lot of people with the disability as well, like getting around can be very taxing. It can be very hard. It can be a lot, right? On your heart rate, on your cardio, it just is, it can be a lot because walking is not easy. So, you know, there's no need to push yourself to a point where then you can't walk the next day, that you can't walk or get around easily for a few days because you went too hard on a certain day. Um, you know, it's being honest and realistic with what ex abilities you do currently have and trying to improve them as you can, but in a systematic way that makes sense so that you're not overwhelming yourself. Um, I'm still learning that. I'm still struggling with that because, you know, new things happen every day. You know, and having done this for 32 years now, like I'm still finding new, new adventures and new opportunities that I have to, you know, weave my way through. Um, but I've had enough experience now and enough tools to say, like, I know what's 
probably the best you know approach to the situation. So. Well, that's a lovely thing to, to finish up on. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Peter. Voice. Let's go. Voice FM.